Okay, I think it's time already to start with the presentations. Okay. So, mm -hmm. hi everyone, this is Wednesday in the Force 4 g 2021. Following the next talk will be with Numa Gwenlin, who will be presenting versus side geoprocessing with 2GS and Leafred. It's not half past, but I guess that it should be okay to start already. So, it's a yours. Okay, so I'll start. Well, first of all, thank you for attending my presentation. Um, it's about browser-side geoprocessing with TurfJS. And I put leaflets into parentheses because I initially submitted this as a workshop, but it was, I think, misunderstood and it was accepted as a normal talk. And the workshop would have been a focus on leaflets, but really TURF is not necessarily about leaflets. So basically we can also talk about open layers or anything else. So if you're into leaflet, it's gonna be a good talk for you, but if you do something else, that's gonna be fine too. Okay, so let's get started. First, um, where's my mouse here? Okay. So first of all, a brief overview of <clears throat> geoprocessing in the web, uh, how it's been done, let's say historically, or maybe still done, but not necessarily, not necessarily always um, the best option maybe, which a lot of times the thing that's used is called uh, WPS, the Web Processing Service. Uh, it's an OGC standard, which it's a standard, it's well established, um, it's documented. But the thing with it is it requires a couple of things, such as a server-side infrastructure. So you need a server, first of all. Uh, you need requests, obviously, that means you need to be connected to the internet. Actually, that's my last point here. And so basically just, if you're not really into web mapping or how all this stuff works. So basically you have a person that could be you or me, and we're using a website, um, a web map, and we wanna, um, let's say, create a buffer. So we set a point on the map, maybe at, at a distance, and then we say calculate. So what happens is that information is sent to a server and on that server, the, um, the final result is calculated, the buffer, for example. So the output is a buffer. And once that's calculated, it's sent back to me, and then it's shown in my web map. That's just the workflow, how it works, and it's totally fine. The thing is, um, you have this communication here. So you go from the user to a server. You always have, you have the communication, which means you have an extra step. And again, that's not necessarily a bad thing, and there's a lot of uh, ways where it makes sense. But a lot of times it's maybe not necessary. So it makes sense where let's say calculations analysis are pretty complex or you have a lot of data. But what I've, what I've noticed over the years is kind of that a lot of people use it just to do something very simple. Let's say like the buffer example, I click on a map and I want a buffer, you know, that's just a very easy calculation. There's not a need to necessarily send that to a server to calculate all that stuff. And so what kind of came up is the idea, well, let's just do that with uh, a different library or let's do that in the browser, for example, with TERF.js. So TERF is one of, I guess, a few libraries that would let you um, do geoprocessing or analysis in your browser. And yeah, so let's get to turf. Let's talk about it a little bit and I'll show some examples and how it's used. And if you don't know it yet and you need to do some simple analysis or maybe even more complex sometimes, look into it. It's, it's a really cool library and it's I use it a lot at work just for different things. It's always there's always something popping up where I'm like, OK, turf would be a good idea now. So I really like it. So I also like to present it. Um, so what is turf? There's a blog post from, you can see that this was around Christmas. This is a good present, <laughs> 2014. So it's a while ago. Um, but the idea was we have GIS for web maps, okay? We all know what GIS is here, and this would be GIS for web maps. Um, you can read that blog post, but you could also listen to my talk and I'll give you a brief introduction. And the point here is that Turf uses JavaScript. It's a JavaScript library, okay? So you're into programming, you know JavaScript, you have a bunch of libraries, and Turf is one of them. And the really interesting and important point, again, is this JavaScript component. Why is that so important? Because 
for a few reasons. Um, first of all, it runs in your browser. So all you need is a browser. I was talking about the server side infrastructure where you send something, get something back. That part is just omitted from all of this. So basically you have your browser and you stay in your browser the whole time. Um, so you don't need that server side infrastructure, which that's a thing if you're in a big company and you have um, server administrators and people who just do that stuff, it's not a big deal. But if you maybe a lot of open source people just say they develop some cool things and maybe they don't have the knowledge of every single part and they don't necessarily always have the help, the people who help them do that, you know? So for simple things, well, you don't need that server side infrastructure again. Um, so it runs in your browser. If you know JavaScript, that's all you need to know. I need to know how to read the documentation, which a lot of people unfortunately skip a lot of times, but it's really worth it with Turf because documentation is really good. I'll show you that. Uh, another thing is can be used offline. I know when I say this and tell people, well, one of the benefits is you can use it offline. And then most people are, well, why do you use a web map offline? It's a web map, right? So I agree, but there's a lot of cases where you can use JavaScript offline. Um, one, one thing I use quite a lot, actually, I work on mobile apps um, with uh, PhoneGap Cordova, which you can deploy to Android or iOS um, devices. And most of them are just for data collection or some offline GIS tasks. So people are collecting data somewhere in the world where there's no internet, a lot of times far away from urban areas, you don't have internet. And then offline is important. And also those people might collect some GPS points and might uh, want to run a buffer or something. So that would be an example where offline is really cool. You have the web map functionality, you have your offline tiles, but you're still in a web map in a way. So that's pretty cool because once you have a server side infrastructure, you need to have the connection. Once you're offline, you can not send the info that you wanna run a buffer, for example. It's not all about buffering. I know I keep mentioning that, but that's the thing I know everyone knows what it's about. So um, yeah, so a brief overview of Turf. Um, so first of all, why use it? I mean, I gave you a few points, a few um, pluses already, um, but one of them also would be it's very easy to use, really simple to use. Um, and that's part also why, because the, the documentation is really great. The docs, Turf docs are, really good. I really love them. Anything that you need is in there. It's well documented. It's easy to follow. And it's always brief. You don't have to read a million things. It's just easy to follow. Another thing is it's it's modular. There's a little many, many different components to it. You don't need to just load the whole thing. You can just grab one little thing. I'm not sure an example in a second. Um, and it's flexible. That's where I'm saying again, it's not only about leaflet. That was my initial talk, but it's not what it's about anymore. So it's flexible. You can add it to any web mapping client. So you work with open layers um, or maybe Google Maps, whatever you use, any web mapping client that understands GeoJSON, for example, um, would be able to load Turf and use Turf. I'll get into that in a second. So there's, there's going to be more information about how to use it. So if you look at the methods or functions or tools, whatever you call them, um, there's there's quite a few. There's probably about 100 at this point. Here's just a few that people kind of relate to or know what they're about, as in calculating a centroid, calculating a distance, buffering something, intersect, exploding, uh, union, flip. Flip is awesome. It flips the coordinates, so if you... <laughs> If you get confused if let lawn x and y common thing i see it quite a lot um then flip is good because it just flips the coordinates and and you're good you don't need to write that loop that just does it you know you just have the function so there's just a lot of functions and you can look at those in the documentation in the website on the website and you get a good overview but basically any classic gis tool that you know you'd find it in turf any classic geoprocessing tool, okay? And we're talking about the little components here, not necessarily crazy complex algorithms, but a lot of times it's the, the typical functions that maybe you even know, learn about in the first week of taking a GIS class, for example, you know? Um, so it's all divided up in different categories. Um, yeah, just, 
I don't have to mention all of them now you see them on the slide, but you have things like measurement. Obviously you measure distances or areas um, and so on. Um, we have data functions for generating random data. Um, what else? Classification, you can create grids. Uh, transformation, also a very important thing in GIS. Uh, feature conversion and so on. So there's different categories with all of them have quite a few functions mostly, and you can use them for different things. Another thing that I really enjoy is the Boolean stuff. It just gives you true or false answers for the things you do. So you could say something like, is that point in a polygon? And it gives you a true. That's another thing that's it's very, very simple, but it can be very, very convenient, especially if you don't have to write all that code all the time. Um, so how do you get started? An important thing to know is you don't need API keys or anything. You might see examples that load some API or some client that needs a key, but Terps by itself is just pure JavaScript, no connection to anything. So you download it, you include it, and you get started. Um, how do you add it to your library, to your application? Well, either you can download the whole thing as a JavaScript file. That would be just the classic way to add it. But the more modern, more flexible way would be NPM. And the cool thing about this is, as I said, it's a modular um, library. So you can just get, get one little piece that you need. And here's a, a, just an image of the documentation, just one of many, many functions. And if you look at the docs here, I just circled this, you can see the NPM, NPM command. So basically, you just go to documentation you see how to get that into your application. So you just type that into your terminal and then you install that module. And the good thing is it also de uh, installs the dependencies. So a lot of times you need way more than just the thing you actually want to install, but then it takes care of that. And that's I think that's really awesome because if you don't, you don't want to overload your application with everything if all you need is calculating a distance or something very simple, you know? So th that's a good thing to mention. So I'd recommend looking at it that way you need something you add it and anything else you just skip so another question that i i get a lot of that also confused myself at at first i mean i've been using it for a few years but at first i thought it was um, a mapbox uh, just a mapbox js thing but really mapbox was involved obviously and it's been developer it's a big project many people are involved now and the official examples all use mapbox.js which is a good library obviously um, but that's just the example so some people think that it only works with mapbox that's not the case so if you were confused about that part it doesn't matter you can use it with leaflets with open layers um, with yeah anything anything you want really um, and the good thing yeah I added to my slide because I I think it's important to mention is you can actually use it with no web map at all. So if you want to do um, just some calculation, some generation of some data or something, you can use it. You don't need that map. And I've actually done it quite a lot that I just like, I need to do something really quick and I'm too lazy to maybe write a Python script for it because sometimes it's a little more work and this commands here are very simple, very easy to use. and I just don't even add a map. I just load turf, start my browser, use my console, and just type something in, and I get my results. Um, yeah, so that was about how to use it and how to add it. And again, here, mapping is, is optional. So, And if you look at most examples that people use turf for, usually the map exists to show the results or maybe to select the inputs. I've seen that too. But really, you don't need a map to use turf. So it's more mainly the thing around it is the map, but the actual thing turf is just a standalone thing, gets inputs and spits out some results, but no map required necessarily. So an important thing here is GeoJSON. And if you're into web mapping or if you're generally into GIS programming, you've probably heard of it. If not, I'll explain a few things. And I hope for those who use it a lot, it's not too boring, but um, that's really, the most important part of TERF is GeoJSON. So that's the data format that's used in TERF. Um, and it's a cool format because 
everything is in one, one file, it's one structure. I'm saying file or structure because sometimes it's saved as a file, but you, it's basically just JavaScript. So it's just a bunch of brackets and parentheses and strings and whatever. So you have it all in, in one structure. So you have your geometry, you have your attributes, they're called properties, and also the coordinate system information, which again, it's not the most important thing because the current version of the standard actually tells you it should all be WGS84. So back in the days, it's been used with different coordinate systems, but not a lot of people do that anymore. Um, if you're interested in the details, just look at the specification. Um, I think it's really well written and easy to understand. So, so I teach um, classes next to being a developer, and a lot of times we talk about standardization and you know spatial data infrastructure and Inspire. That's a big thing in Europe with the metadata and all that stuff. And when you look at, let's say, an OGC standard, um, you get anything you need. It's so much information, but it overwhelms people a lot. So a lot of times, for good, just for a good example of a um, standard, I just show them GeoJSON because I feel like it's very easy to understand. And if you work with it a little bit, that's what happened to me. I looked into it, and I was just reading it because it was bored one day, and I learned new things too. So it was very interesting. So I just want to mention that look at the GeoJSON standard, even if you know the format already. You might want to might be able to learn something new, um, and it's short. You can read it before you go to bed. You don't need a half day. Um, so basically, what it looks like is, <clears throat> yeah, as I said, a bunch of curly braces and arrays, and you have your um, your floats, your numbers, and your strings. And so you have different data types, which we point, line, string, polygon. You have the multi-geometries as well, and you have some collections, whatever. Uh, but basically, it comes down to this. So once you have that structure, you can work with turf. And that structure is just text. It's just typed in. So either you can write that from scratch, which no one does that because it costs too much time, and you just mess some, something up at some point. You just miss a comma or something. Um, the other thing I just mentioned that just want to mention it here for the people who are not into it you can if you have shape files if you still work with shape files for some reason in 2021 um, or maybe some other format that just doesn't work with a web map um, you just load it into your gis qgis for example because it's super easy to use and you just right click and you save it as a geojson okay and then you get this thing here that's a structure and how to get into a web page well basically just add a variable to it and you copy it into the page. A lot of times I save it as a JavaScript file if it's stuff that's static that I just don't change all the time. But you could also load it from a database, whatever. That's a little more complex. And then you need the server-side infrastructure. Um, yeah, that's just one example. You could also use uh, Ogre to Ogre. Any, any, any tool that converts data will give you a GeoJSON nowadays, I'd say. So the important thing is the concept of how this actually all fits together that geojson structure so this whole thing if you export it from qgis for example gives you a feature collection but there's different parts and that's the parts when you read the standard you actually understand them maybe a little bit better so you have in a feature collection you have a bunch of features so it's a collection of features right so you get the single feature here that's the thing right here here's not a single feature within a single feature you have a geometry and within the geometry you have a position why am i even mentioning this because a lot of turf tools exactly require one of those so they'll say you need a position or you need a feature or you need a geometry and i used when i started with turf i just threw a feature collection and everything and half the things didn't work and i did not understand why and then i read the docs because that's what you should do <laughs> and then i figured out okay well sometimes they just need a part of the geojson and you might not always be able to really understand why, or you don't think it makes sense, but that's the way it is. And since it's documented, we shouldn't complain and we, shouldn't, we can just use it, you know? So, so again, why is this important? Because a lot of the tools will just accept one little part of that whole feature collection, okay? So here's an example, just if you're in that situation. So here it would be your feature collection. And if you want a feature from that, well, you just access the feature array. That's this thing here. And it's the standardized structure, so it's always the same. Then you get the first feature. If you have two, it would be one, right? It's an array. 
then if you want a geometry from the feature, you access the geometry. And if you need the actual position, it's called the coordinates in the standard. So basically, those are the options with that little request here, that query, you can access any part that you would need for turf. I'd say so. I was preparing the slides and I was thinking, but I think that's all I've ever done. It's just either you need a feature, you need geometry or the coordinates directly. Sometimes also the whole feature collection. And when you get something back from a turf tool, it's almost always either of those two. Sometimes you get a true or false, the Boolean, obviously, as I mentioned, and sometimes you just get a number if you calculate a distance, for example, okay? So once you know that, you're fine. And yeah, some slides about using turf. So yeah, just read the documentation. That really, really, that's all you have to do. Um, anything's been described really well. And I just took a bunch, of, a couple images here, just so you can kind of um, see what it looks like. So here's, a, for example, the buffer. You can see it's short text, not much to read. And then you see the parameters, and then you see some optional stuff which we the curly braces. And then you also see that what it returns. So most of the time, here's the important part, feature collection, geometry feature. You see what it accepts, either of those, but sometimes just one. Then you see what it returns, okay? And I see I need to be finishing soon. So <laughs> let's speed up a little bit. Here's another tool, again, same concept. This time you need a feature as an input and returns a number. So that's what I'm, the only thing you have to watch out for is what does it need the tool? What does it spit out? Once you understand that concept, it's easy to use. Boolean would be, it gives you true or false. And here, some examples, you see how easy it is. Here's an example of a union. So we just add one feature, a second feature, and we get a union of both, right? And returns a feature. Turf explode, polygon, you add a feature. Again, a feature, another feature collection of a polygon, you get a bunch of points. Then we have, this just looked nice, that's why I edited it. I just wrote this application because I was bored one day. It just, for each point I checked in which state it was, and that, that's why I used the Boolean, just looped through the points and did that within check, a Boolean within, right? And here's another, the Bezier curve. Again, it's a feature of a line and it gives you kind of nice looking line. You can add parameters to, yeah, make it look even better. That's just, that was just a couple of examples. And you see they're all very, very simple examples, but mostly that's what Turf is. You have little tools to do really cool things and you combine them and you get something really awesome in the end. The license, because I always forget to talk about the license. That's one question I always get. There's the license, it's an MIT license, so not much to worry about. Um, what else? Um, yeah, I might want to mention my book, the Leaflet Cookbook. Um, it's about, it's a cookbook about leaflets where you can just look up different recipes. There's an entire chapter about TurfJS. So if what you see in this talk, think you think it's interesting, have a look at it. There's a lot more information in it. And really important, all Locate Press books are 40% discount until October 4th. It's possible G special. And there's two more books by um, Tyler Mitchell and Gary Sherman that have an extra special today. So maybe you want to look into it. Just want to mention that, and other than that, there's probably too many ways to contact me, but here's the companies I work for. But here's my Twitter, which I think I've been online last time was eight months ago. I don't know, but maybe I'll have a look at it tonight. We'll see. So if you have questions, let me know. And yeah, I hope you learned something, and I hope you're going to use Turf if you haven't been using it yet, because it's a really cool thing. Um, yeah. Okay. So. Thank you, Nima. Um, yes, it was an uh, it was an answer talk. Thank you for presenting it. We have time for one question, I think. Uh, the one with more votes is: Can you use Turf in on web make cut or projections? Um. Well. Uh, there's, I mean, this is a, it's a good question. Um, mainly turf is based on GeoJSON. Since the standard tells you it should be WGS84, um, that's basically what you limit it to. But there's conversion um, functions in turf that lets you work with coordinate systems. So I assume you could just take something, reproject it, and then you run the turf analysis. Or if you have a client, um, leaflet 
it's kind of simplistic in that way sometimes, but I'm thinking about open layers. You always have the WGS and the, the web Mercator. So it would be very easy to get the source of your vector and reproject it and then add it to turf. But again, that's maybe sounds too complicated. Maybe it's even easier, but I'm not entirely sure because I usually give them straight to your JSONs that are already in WGS 84. Um, but yeah, there's definitely ways maybe with like a little extra step, yeah. Mm -hmm. Any other question? If there's more time for questions. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, uh, that is one that has got a lot of votes. So mm -hmm. let's try to switch it in. Uh, sorry. How do you use it with Q data sets? For example, geometries with million points? Yeah, that's, that's another good point, which I didn't really mention, um, but it, it's hard to say, but you have to try and just see when it stops working. The limitation would not be turf. The limitation actually is your browser. We're not in a GIS here. So if you have a desktop GIS, you can work with a lot of points. If you're in post GIS, millions of points, that all works. You can create indices, whatever. But if you're in a browser, just try to load a really big website on your mobile phone, for example. You see how limited the web in some ways is in a way, you know. And that's the same with Turf. So Turf by itself actually can be run just if you into Node.js and just like using JavaScript for different things, which you can do server side nowadays, really works really well. But if you're in the browser and you're trying to load that big, big GeoJSON, even if it's a couple of megabytes, but if it's a gig or something, and millions of points would be very large, then it won't work. But again, it's not necessarily because of Turf or more because of the infrastructure, yeah. That's a good question. And that, that's, a, that's a point actually where I would say that's where WPS is maybe your best option because you have all your data in your database and you set up a service that does the calculation for you. So that not saying that WPS is always a bad thing. It's just for a lot of times it's, it's just for simple things, it's not necessary, but here that'd be a good point where I'd say, look into that kind of stuff, you know? Mm -hmm. Anything else? No, I think that we will have to cut it now. Okay. We have opened on a little. So thank you very much, right. Neymar, for your talk. And see you around in Force Yeah, thanks so much. And I have another talk coming up in a half hour about Leaflet. So if you want to actually learn something about Leaflet, which was maybe promised in this talk, check out my next talk. OK, sure. thanks so much, everyone. And see you soon, I hope. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.